as I as I mentioned in one, in one of a couple of interviews I did, for me it's not it's not even so much about the releasing of music. It's more about um, for me. It's just uh, it's the process as opposed to the product. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's really what it comes down to. It's just the constant state of development. I don't feel the pressure or the or the need or or so much even the desire to do something like that on a regular basis. For me, it's a whole it's all just about the study of the art and the craft and just constantly working on things that I can't do very well so I can, I can do them and then add, add the ideas to my database for lack of a better description. You jank. I first became aware of my guest when I moved to Toronto in 1987 to attend college. You gotta check him out. I was told by many in the hallways, classrooms, and in the cafeteria. Around the world, jazz guitarists are not only in praise of his playing, but shaking their boots if they have to ever play with him. Oh. <laughs> That's embarrassing, man. <laughs> but it's true, I would imagine. Maybe not everybody, but some people. Well, I don't know. He began a close friendship as well as being a performing and recording partner with Ed Bickert, who, in my opinion, was one of the best jazz guitarists to have ever lived, not just the best Canadian jazz guitarist. In 1980, he released his first album on the Pablo label, produced by another Canadian jazz legend, Oscar Peterson. He also eventually played and toured with Oscar for a time. Other musicians that he has uh, had an opportunity to perform with are Rob McConnell, Chet Baker, Joey DeFrancesco, Pepper Adams, that must have been fun, uh, Ray Brown, Niels Henning Orsted Peterson, and also, I guess, with Oscar Peterson too, right? Yeah. Rosemary Clooney, Kirk McDonald, another Toronto mainstay. Yeah, and great, great player. And, yeah. And Dave Holland. I don't know if this is possible with a CD, but I think I wore out my copy of your 1992 release from Jazz Inspiration, All of You. <laughs> oh. I, I, I listened to that in my car incessantly back in the day. Wow. Uh, driving to like teaching or gigs or wherever I had to go. You know, it's funny you mention that. Like I've got a CD that's in my car that is not a jazz CD. It's a, it's a, the second... I guess the second version of uh, Glenn Gould playing the Goldberg variations. And to right. me, it's just the touch, the phrasing, everything about it. I mean, you know, obviously technically brilliant, but it, it's much deeper than that. The, you know, the sound, the, the feelings that he evokes with all these different movements. It's, uh, I just, I listen to it all the time and it's been very inspirational actually in my jazz playing. Yep. In terms of like, especially if you're playing if you're doing an intro to a tune or you're playing a ballad or you're doing something that is sonically at a, a, a lower level, like a quieter level, you know, where you can really bring out the, to try and bring out the individual voicings in the, mm -hmm. in the chords and develop a uh, kind of a sense of chord and, and melody. Uh, Separation. Yeah, independence and, and yeah. interdependence where they kind of blend together. I've been, spent, I've been doing that for a long, long time trying to you know that's something i've been working on and it's yeah it's getting there but and that's uh, well you know because you try and approach the guitar that way too from a more pianistic standpoint and that's something that right. is very hard to do on the guitar and sort of make it convincing and when i hear piano players and especially people playing classical pieces where you have all these different voices moving at different times uh it, it really sort of drives the point home. Well, I think you would. I think you would agree with me that we probably both have pianist envy. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Yeah. Actually, I've got a piano at home. My wife plays a bit of classical piano, and I mean, I can play. I can find voicings and things, but I've never. I never ever sit down at the piano and and uh, play things on it. I go to the guitar and say, "Well, if, if a piano player was going to do that in terms of the you know the, the pitch material they draw from, I would." Uh, you know, I would just try it and take some of those notes and, of course, use open string combinations and things like that. So, right. But uh, anyway, I'm getting in the way of your yeah. introduction oh, here. So. Yeah, no worries. No worries. No worries. So. Like I said, it's very informal. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm very honored to have as my guest someone that I have looked up to and admired for many years, 
Lauren Losky, thank you for doing this interview. Oh, my pleasure. The first thing we, that we need to get out of the way is, what's your favorite reverb pedal? Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't use any effects. I don't even use reverb. No, I, I know. I, I That was more of a joke. I, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know that. I, actually, but you know, when, that recording, you know, when I'm on a recording, they'll, they'll put on some post-production reverb just a little bit, just to sort of maybe make it sound like to match the other instruments, I guess. Yeah. You know what I mean? But Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, it's what it is. And I don't have a problem with that as long as I don't sound like I'm in the middle of the Grand Canyon or something. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I did an interview with Tim Lurch uh -huh. recently, and he and he's kind of into that same impression that when the reverb overpowers the original tone source, it's yeah. it's it's almost makes you feel ill or something. It's it's unnatural. Well, I think it actually compromises the sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, and 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 by extension, it compromises the music. Uh, I, now, I know there's a lot of great players out there that use all sorts of effects and, you know, more power to them, uh, no pun intended. But, yeah. um, but it's for, for what I like to do, even if I do stuff that's more adventurous harmonically, I, I still don't like really like that ambient sound. I think I, I think there's a way of getting it out of the guitar without uh, through touch and, and open string combinations, like I said, and um, and you know, well, you know, do you still play with the thumb picking fingers or, or that's all you... that's I've been playing that way since like a hundred percent since probably 2002, 2003. Okay. When did you come to my house? Uh, well, I did come to your house, uh, a few, t a few times, yeah, but two, two or three when, times. Yeah, uh, when, um... uh, it might've been like around, like, I don't know, maybe a year or two of me getting into playing that way. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I know I, I never, worked I yeah. worked really hard at it, I know. <laughs> Me too. As a yeah. matter of fact, you know, when I first I remember I did this radio show and I decided to just lose just to forget about the flat pick and I went into this radio show. It was kind of a you know it wasn't like a, a high um like a high profile thing, but it was for a Toronto radio station. Anyway, I went in and I had no idea what to do with my right hand. I was just I thought, well, I'll do a bit of this, and I'll do a bit of that, and then I thought, well, well, I can't really sustain this. It doesn't feel natural. Right. And then I, I, I went back to the conservatory, and I took a few classical lessons with this guy, Robert Hamilton, at the Toronto Conservatory, Royal Conservatory. I went for about a year, took some fairly regular lessons, and then, but I was doing that without the thumb pick, and then I was, then I discovered the thumb pick, and then I... And then it kind of went from there, but that was a long, long time ago. You know, we're looking right. at like 1980, oh God, early 80s, 83, 84, something like that. You know? Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. It so, takes a long time though. Well, well I was going to ask you about uh, the thumb pick thing, because I know that you didn't always play with the thumb picks, but that was the kind of, you kind of answered that question. Um, yeah, I hit a wall technically. I'm left-handed, but I play right-handed, and I, I personally felt like I hit kind of a, a technical brick wall, and I couldn't feel. I didn't feel like I, I could go any further. Trying to balance being left-handed and you know taking advantage of that in a way by you know hammer-on slurs, pull-off slides, all that, but not doing that all the time. Right. And then trying to reconcile that with being able to do the. You know, typically the you know the alternate picking, and then sometimes a bit of the sweep stuff, and I was getting pretty good at it. But then when I started listening to piano players, I thought this technique for me anyway, it's not working anymore. I yep. wanted to try and branch out and see if I could even try and even remotely uh, um, like find some sort of a compromise or approximate the the sound, not the sound of a piano, but the same technical. Uh, approach where you, you can get, like I said earlier, where you get multiple moving voicings and, you know, like, yeah, chord melody independence, different dynamic, uh, different dynamic levels at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Like and that. that is really hard to, to, oh, to yeah. do. But it's yeah. really hard to do that with a, with a flat pick. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, uh, even Ed didn't really do that. Ed had a wonderful touch, but it was fairly consistent. But incredible. I mean, like, yeah. like I said recently on Facebook, you know, after Ed, they kind of broke the mold. You know, I mean, I agree. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. 
Incredible. Well, how, how old were you when you got started playing guitar? And what inspired you to learn guitar? You mean initially? Yeah. Like, like in the very beginning? Yeah, very, the oh, very, God, early, well, I, very, very early days. Oh, I think, well, the, the, I think I was about 11 or 12. And uh, I think a good friend of mine at the time, his parents were sending him for guitar lessons. And it was like $3.50 a half hour. My, and I said, you mm -hmm. know, I, I wouldn't mind getting a guitar. You know, why not? So my parents bought me this guitar. The guitar cost $16. Right. It was a piece of crap. It was the actual, there was a little stamp inside. I'll never forget. It said Grange. G-R-A-N-G-E. Made in Czechoslovakia. Steel string guitar. Absolutely, you know, horrid construction. I couldn't, and I had no calluses. I couldn't play like an F bar chord on my guitar, you know. Right. As a matter of fact, my teacher taught me the House of the Rising Sun, and, the, the, and if you do it in A minor, you know, the fourth chord is F, and it, the, the strings were so high off the neck <laughs> at the nut, she said, okay, play an F sharp chord. It was the wrong <laughs> chord, but just yeah. to play something that would approximate the shape. And then and then from there, I um, and then I took some of these, it was Aaron Schur, a classical method, which is, you know, just basically, oh, yeah. you know, P-I-M-A-I-M-I, -I -I, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it was great to actually work on. Unfortunately, I had no nails at the time. And I never practiced. I always got up in the morning of my uh, of the lesson and practiced, like tried to do something for a couple of hours. And anyway, so moving forward, uh, when I was 13, my parents bought me a nylon string guitar. It was quite a nice guitar at the time. It was in Espana. I think it was about 175 dollars, which back then was a lot of money. Right. Because that was see, I was uh, 13, so. So I was. It was like 1967. Uh, that's the year I was born. That was a good year. Oh, well, there you go. Man. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, yeah. And uh, and then I discovered, you know, rock music too. And then I, my parents bought me uh, an Espana electric guitar, oh, okay. which wasn't bad at all. For a beginner electric guitar, it was fantastic. And then, uh, you know, in a crappy little Kent amplifier. And then a few years later, you know, I got into the cream and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and then I bought a... Uh, Secondhand, very beat up Fender Dual Showman and bought a Les Paul. And oh wow! I wanted, I wanted to be Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page and Johnny Winter and all that. Well, that's a big bump up, a Dual Showman from a a Kent amplifier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, it was. The yeah. note coming through those amp, that amp was was huge, probably. Yeah, and it had two fifteen uh, JBLs, and it had chicken wire in the front. It looked like it came out of the Blues Brothers movie. It was really funky. The head was great. The cabinet, the actual baffle holding the speakers in, if you leaned it forward too much, the thing, it wouldn't fall out, but it would start kind of moving out a bit, and I would just push it back in. It was a very funky app. <laughs> and then when I decided to sell it, I sold, mm -hmm. I put an ad in this, in this, uh, you know, one of these buy and seller, like bargain hunter newspapers. I sold wow. it within two hours. Wow. Because some Asian cat came and paid me cash for it. I mean, if I had the head now, it would be worth an absolute fortune. Yeah, well, that, that, uh, my, one of my questions I was going to ask you was, do you have any gear that you wish you still had? <laughs> well, maybe, yeah, not so much the speaker cabinet, but yeah, the head. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And then I had a Bandmaster, and I had a bunch of newer Fender. I went through a whole bunch for a while. I was a real gearhead. I never had a bunch of amps at the same time. I sort of went from one to the other. And then I wound up getting this old Yamaha amp that's actually beside me on the floor that I just love. And I've recorded with it several times. And what, which it. model of, of Yamaha is that? Because oh, I had a Yamaha amp when I was a kid, too. Yeah, it, it's a black face G51-112. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I think I, I had a 212 Yamaha amp. Oh, yeah. Oh, those yeah. are pigs, yeah. I mean, this one you can actually carry. For a while, I had an EV in this thing, and I just I left it in my car, and I just it just sat there because it weighed too much. This is manageable, but it's got a great sound. Uh, and I've got a really, really old, funky orange cube that I wouldn't want to record with because it's kind of noisy. This Yamaha is pretty good, though. I have I an want, or oh, I, yeah. I also have an old Roland cube as well. So, yeah. But it's a jazz, or sorry, it's a uh, bass jazz amp. Jazz Oh, okay. No, a yeah, bass yeah, amp. Yeah. yeah. But I had, uh, remember Buzzy? Oh, as a matter of fact, you know what? The, a, a previous cube, it was mine was rattling like crazy. I actually took that one to Buzzy. And I had this idea. I said, what if you were to take the guts out of the cube and put it in a separate box? All and of a he... sudden, the memory flashed into my head. I happened to go to him with that amp 
when he was working on yours. Oh Has yeah, he... he bought it. It was a company called Hammond, not the organ, but they made all sorts of electronic, you know, different sort of uh... like enclosures and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. things like that. and pr and they probably made transistors and caps and resistors. And anyway, he spent a long time at it. I used to go to the shop. And he kept the weirdest hours. He was on Doncaster. Like in sort of Thornhill, part of Toronto, and uh, and it, for a while it, it was great. It worked great, and uh, I had the separate head, and and then nothing rattled, and it mm -hmm. was great. And then it started doing some weird things, and then I just I got rid of it. So I, I typically, so if I'm just going to jam or something, I'll use the cube, and then if I've got a gig where maybe the odd one I have to record or something, if they don't have something at the studio, I'll take my Yamaha, and I've got two Ibanez Roadstars. That's it. That's all I got. Yeah, no, I, I kind of, uh, I'm not a huge gear guy either. And matter of fact, I didn't even start getting into pedals um, until probably like late 2000s, into the like 2010-ish right. area yeah. or era. And, you know, I do have a reverb pedal and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. it seems like I my pedal board is probably big for a jazz guitar player. But I, I try to use things tastefully, and then I've got pedals that will m make me sound like an organ player. <laughs> right, I've heard those. Yeah, it's kind of a cool sound. Yeah. Yeah, that just yeah, just mean, for certain songs and yeah. stuff that I do that that I that well, I want I wanted that vibe, and without hiring yeah. an extra person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I mean, listen, man. I mean, in the right in the right context, the pedal the pedals are are amazing. They're fantastic. It's just yeah. that I I just don't I don't hear it that way. Just me. This is just my personal take on things and uh i don't um everybody's got the right to to uh, use whatever technology they've got at their disposal ultimately if you can do something musical with it it's fan it's great you yeah know? well what i say is everyone's entitled to my opinion <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's um, a good yeah, so. <laughs> what got you interested in playing jazz oh well Actually, um, let's see. A couple of friends of mine, one of one of whom I, is my oldest friend. His name is Shelley Berger. Uh, he was oh yeah, 30, yeah bass player. 30, yeah, yeah. I've known him for like fifty years. He um, actually longer than that now at this point. But um, anyway, he uh, he was getting into jazz before I did, and. Um, he, he was listening to, well, a host of different things, but he was listening to Kind of Blue, you know, which is a, 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 sort of a pathway that a lot of people you know, seem to have followed. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's some of the tunes on there, like, so what, very accessible because it's a lot of the same chord. You know, the challenge, of course, is keeping your place and trying to be musical. But it, it's, you know, if you're jamming on in a rock vein and you're playing on D minor and then you hear you know, a swing feel and you're hearing something, you know, primarily based around the sound of D minor, then once you sort of get your head around that and then listen to the different feel, it's kind of a bridge point where you can sort of, uh, you know, like not cross over and, and leave the rock thing necessarily, but it's a, it's a way of introduce, getting introduced to something that you can sort of relate to because it's kind of based on some of the harmonic material and scalar material that you've probably already have been playing right based on yeah. the rock thing or the you know the pop thing whatever so i sort of started off with that I, and i used to listen to the recording incessantly not having really any idea about form and what they were actually doing there was just something about it that i found beautiful and mysterious and fresh different and that sort of started my journey into like serious improvised music you know, as opposed to like blues based string bending improvised music. Right. Yeah. With me, it was, I started off playing country and bluegrass. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my first guitar hero was Chet Atkins. So I would sit in there with my dad's record collection with the needle and trying to figure out how to, how he was doing that kind of stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and then actually that's, I, I, I got, started playing with a thumb pick early on although i left that behind once i started gigging more because i joined the musician junior when i was 12 and i've basically been gigging ever since wow so did uh, you through chet atkins is that where you discovered lenny kind well of like a... in a it lenny was a lot later on it was um 
believe it or not, I I got really heavy into Eddie Van Halen because like Eddie Van Halen was the, probably like your Eric Clapton of the day. And uh, very much so, yeah. Another yeah, good, yeah, guitar god, kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. then, um, by the time I was probably around nineteen or so, uh, I read in a guitar magazine Eddie was talking about Alan Holdsworth. So, so I, I, I went, well, if Eddie Van Halen says this guy is amazing, I better check him out. So <laughs> mm-hmm. I bought a couple of recordings and, and when I picked my jaw up off the floor that like, wow, there's way more in to this, to the world of music than what I know. I hear you. I, 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 put, I, remember, I, yeah. Yeah. I put, it put me on a path to, to go to Humber college in 1987 as like, a, um, it was, a referring back to in my intro there mm-hmm. to right. try and figure out what what alan holdsworth was doing but but i kind of got bit bit by the jazz bug more than the fusion bug right and it kind of stuck <laughs> and then yeah. th- yeah. you know through like peter harris at the time was was the guitar teacher and mm-hmm. he was he, not only did he own a a lenny bro guitar that lenny gave him but you know he he would he, he kind of sort of played in that style so it was a little bit of influence but it wasn't until Lenny's daughter came out with the movie in around 1999 or so. That's when it, when I watched that movie, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back to playing with the thumb pick and stuff. Well, it's funny. Actually, she came down to the, I was playing with Kirk McDonald at the Rex and I think she was in town for the, I guess the Toronto preview of it or whatever. And, um, it's, it's great. She also, she put out a sort of a second uh, yeah. installment of it, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got to meet her and talk with her for a minute and tell her, you know, what a huge fan I was of, of her father and stuff like that. But uh, she's very sweet, and um, it's great that she did something like that to sort of try and create some sort of a lasting legacy for him. Cause yeah, he, and I, he, he was totally unique, you know. So, I mean, Holdsworth was too, and Ed is. There's a lot of great individuals out there. The thing that really, that I think is amazing is that in Toronto, for quite a long time, there were the, the the three top guitar players in the country, jazz guitar players, lived in Toronto: Sonny Granich, Ed, and Lenny, <laughs> and all completely stylistically different, and all right. equally beautiful in their own way. You know, they even did a record together. It was sort of a, it was not really commercial, but it, it had a commercial bent here and there. It was called Soft and Groovy. Okay. And the three of them being featured together on some tunes and then individually with the Jimmy Dale Orchestra. And then was, sometimes a small group as well. It all, just from the uh, the title, it almost sounds like it was from that the TV show that Lenny had on CBC. Uh, no, it wasn't, <laughs> but, I, but I remember that. Yeah. yeah. That was great, too. That was amazing, actually. Some of the stuff Lenny played there. That was a little bit before my time, but... Uh, yeah, I think... Well, how old are you now? 54. Oh yeah, because I was born in '67. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So I'm I'm 67 years old now. So yeah, I got I got a few years on you. So. Right. Yeah. Well, I I just remember like there's there's a a group of you guys in Toronto like Ted Quinlan, yourself, Re- Vito Retza, and all those guys. You're all around the same age. Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. Did you? Well, speaking of of Lenny. Did you ever do gigs with Lenny or, or take any lessons from him? No, no, uh, none of the above. But I, I was, uh, I was tasked tasked with picking up Lenny from a place in Toronto. Uh, he was living at there was kind of a singer actor named Don Franks that Lenny was living with. Yep. At the time, and many many years before, Lenny was part of a group <clears throat> called Three, with Don Franks singing and a bass player named. Uh, Ian Ian Henstridge, right? Ian Wimp Henstridge, he he died. I don't know if he if he did, committed suicide or if he if he had a drug reaction or I, I, I don't remember. Anyway, he died fairly young. Don was around for a long. Don Franks, who's kind of a weird cat. Anyway, he he he. Uh, I think he's still around, or maybe he died recently. I, I think remember. he died a couple of years ago, or yeah, something. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, Lenny was staying at his house on Heath Street around Bathurst in St. Clair. A professor at York said, uh, Lenny's going to come and do a clinic at York. 
while he's in town uh, doing a gig at Bourbon Street. I said, oh, amazing. He said, can you go pick him up? I said, of course. <laughs> so I, I went to pick him up, and we just chatted about any number of things in the in the car. And, uh, not so much about music, just about just the kind of everyday stuff. He came into this unbelievable clinic, sort of gave away all his secrets, how he does what he does, and was very generous with the information, and a bunch of people taped it. And then I took him back, and, and that was it. And then I heard him a bunch of times at Bourbon Street. But yeah, it would have been amazing to play with him, but um, at the, I wasn't equipped at that time. Hey, what, when was that? Oh, God. Uh, well, that would have been maybe... Shit, that might have been... That's probably the, the very early 80s. Okay. Yeah, because I think if I, around 83, I started playing with Ed Bicker. So if Lenny was in town around then, and I had the opportunity to play with him, I would have jumped at it. So it had to have been before. Okay. And then that was a great segue into Ed Bicker, because I was going to ask you, um, you know, as I mentioned before, you played with Ed Bickert in, the, in your well, early years. days. Yeah, for years. Yeah. And uh, how, so how many years did you play with Ed? I think 83 to 90 or 91, give or take. I imagine that was like a, an education there, playing with him. Like, Man, like probably well, like, three or four university uh, degrees right there. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, it, you know, we played regularly at Georgia Spaghetti House, and we played a bit of Bourbon Street. We went to Spain and did a little mini tour, and we did a whole bunch of other gigs, uh, sometimes a duo and then just different clubs, sometimes clinics, concert clinics. Did those two records together? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was just an absolutely wonderful experience. I mean, I, I can't really put into words how uh, inspirational it was and instructional. Yeah. And we never, he never said, you know, you know, you could play this voicing or you could do this. We, we never talked about that shit. Mm -hmm. He just played. And I, you know, I think the the greatest lesson I got from Ed was whenever I heard him play. He didn't say this, but he, he was intimating it. It was like, okay, I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, you do what you do. Yeah. And for many years, I, because I was, he was, uh, I just idolized his playing. And he's, he was a wonderful person. And I, I, I fell under, he was sort of like, without him even uh, attending this, he became my Svengali. Like I was under his shadow. Just like if you're a piano player and you get to hang with Bill Evans. Yep. I mean, like, how good is that? Or Oscar mm -hmm. Peterson, or, or, you know, if you play the same instrument, you know. Yeah. It was just amazing. And then I, you know, I I definitely, I mean, and I, I readily admit he was, he's been a huge influence on my playing, and I've added quite a few other things in along the way, and as, as I should, like anybody should, it's just a natural flow of information and development. But, yeah, that was the great lesson. He just said, okay, I'm just, I'm going to, this is how I'm hearing it, you know, uh, I just, you know, I, I just finished my solo. Now you play. And yeah. It wasn't, there was no, no threat, like no, never a sense of like ego or one up. He was one of the most self-effacing people I've ever met. I heard a story that Don Sebesky called him to do something in New York for some project. I forget what it was. And Ed said, well, I, I bet there's a whole bunch of great guitar players that you could probably call in New York. <laughs> and he hung up the phone. He didn't want to do it. Right. You know? He was just so, you know. So, I mean, w yeah. He never thought, he never, I mean, to everybody else, <clears throat> he was just like, you know, God's gift to guitar, as far as I'm concerned. He never, he never uh, looked at it that way. And, I mean, and you know, most serious, most people that are serious about what they do in anything, you know, ideally, you know, shouldn't sit around going, you know, hey, I'm the shit, you know. Well, it, well anybody first, that's, yeah, yeah, anybody that's, a, sorry to interrupt, but anybody no, no, that's no a serious ar artist and is following a path is doing exactly that. They're just on, they're just following the path. And regardless of how great or whatever they're playing, it's just another step along the path. And yeah. that's how he, uh, you know, that's how he approached it. And that's how I approach it, too. That's why, to me, the recording thing, he was never a big fan of recording either. It's funny. i got to tell you a funny story, too. This is real. I think this is really, 
I, I thought it's kind of ironic in a way, and I didn't realize this until recently. There was a, a guitar player named Tony Braden. I don't know if you know that name. Do you know that name at all? I, I don't think the name rings a bell, uh, no. Well, before Ed came to town, Tony was like one of the guys doing a lot of work, and, and Tony did quite a bit of teaching, and he came up with kind of a method that he used that in certain ways was quite good. It didn't teach a lot about music, but about getting around the instrument, different ways of negotiating scales, different finger uh, groupings on different strings, you know, like nuts and bolts stuff. Right. Anyway, Ed, Ed went to Tony very early on, you know, maybe a little bit after he came to Toronto from Vernon, BC. And he, he went to Tony for some lessons, apparently. And then after, and Ed had ridiculous perfect pitch, like he could hear paint dry, you know. And um, he went to Tony Brain. After a while, he was getting a little bit sort of dis, you know, disenchanted, not with Tony, but with the kind of studies that they were doing together. You know, and Ed was out gigging and, and uh, you know, and just wanting to get better, like, like all of us. Anyway, I think at some point he said, I don't know, I, I can't say it verbatim, but he said something to Tony like, you know, I, I don't think, um, I don't think I'm finding in, our, in, in my study with you, like, what it is I'm sort of looking for. And then Tony said, well, why don't you just get a, a here's an idea, why don't you get a bunch of jazz records and sort of figure it out on your own? And Ed said, and that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, and you can tell, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he used to listen to big band recordings and listen to the, the saxophone and, and trombone sections. And that's where, he, I think, in large part, he got a lot of, of those great ideas for all those moving voicings. It's like orchestrating and arranging on the fly. It's right. incredible. And But the, what I was going to say was, after reading that and seeing that in an, a series of inter, uh, uh, YouTube uh, interviews, he did with his son, Jeff was off camera when I heard that I just thought I thought man that's exactly what happened to me I mean I'm not putting myself in Ed's league but the same the same trajectory I went to I went to Ed in 19 I went up to Ed in the club in 1970 as I was 16 and I said I asked him after asked him if he taught he said no I don't teach he said, but there's a guy named Tony Braden you might want to check out. That's the guy Ed went to years before. Mm -hmm. I went, well, Ed said, go to Tony. I'll check him out. So I went to Tony for about a year and a half, maybe two years. I still have the notes somewhere in a filing cabinet. Not that I haven't looked at them in eons. But anyway, about after a year and a half, two years, I sort of got disenchanted. And I, I just, I said, I think, you know, I got a lot to work on here. You know, I'm going to try and do some stuff on my own. And then a couple years later, I already knew about Ed, but I heard Pure Desmond, which really, which was really like featuring Ed in a major way, as you know. Yeah, that was and that 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 record was a very big influence on me. Oh, as when well. I heard that, that was my that was like kind of blue 2.0 for me. That was like what you know, especially featuring guitar. I just thought, and I heard it, I actually heard the heard it for the first time on the radio at Shelley Berger's parents' cottage near Orillia, Ontario. And I just almost fell off a picnic table. It was just so beautiful. And it just sounded like otherworldly. Like he sounded like an orchestra when he played those chords, those voicings. Anyway, and then so I got the, re of course, the next day, I think I went out to Sam the Record Man and got the record. And then I listened to it a bunch. Then I transferred it to reel to reel tape. And that began my journey of trying to figure out what Ed Bickert did. And it was a long and fruitful journey. And for a while, I wanted to be, Ed, instead of Eric Clapton, I wanted to be Ed Bickert. I got yeah. just totally, in, like, I just was living and breathing that album. And then when the Live at Bourbon Street came out and then other things. And, and now I don't really, I don't listen to him anymore because the influence is so in my playing. If I hear anything by Ed now, I just sort of go back into my Ed Bickert mode. Just like if I heard Eric Clapton play, I would kind of, you know, just start playing that shit for a little bit. Just for fun at home. I, I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. I, yeah. And everybody, everybody, yeah. anybody that you know that was influenced by someone, it's like, it, it, it's like a switch. So I wanted to sort of turn off the switch, while still retaining all the wonderful things that I learned from Ed. And I'm not talking about licks, or even voicings. Just an yeah. approach. Just an yep. approach. You know. Although I did lift a few of his solos, note for note. And I, even though I had limited theoretical knowledge, I actually figured out, uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, 
layperson's way what he was doing. So I could take those sounds and then apply them to other tunes as opposed to just playing that song to those songs. Well, that's so a that, whole that, different other story, isn't it? <laughs> well, you like, know, yeah, I mean, that's um, Bill Evans and a lot of players. They, what they did was they, they, they listened to players they admired and they would try and sort of, instead of figuring out licks, they would look at the underlying principles behind what would generate the, the concept. Or the or the concept that would generate the sound, and then he then he would work perfect those concepts in a more generic way, and then he would put them to all together. So you know, Bill had Bud Powell, Horace Silver, some Oscar Peterson, uh, George Shearing, Monk, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Lenny Tristano. I'd yeah. say those were the, the five main things that were in his playing. You know, and plus cla heavy classical training from when he was a child, and you put all that together, and man. What, you know what you get? You get Bill Evans. Right. You know, you don't get Winton Kelly. You get Bill Evans. Uh, you know. And that's that's the thing. So, you know, this whole thing now where, where people are bass players or people on different instruments are taking, you know, they're lifting Michael Brecker solos and playing them maybe on other instruments. I mean, it's, I mean, it's very impressive. But I'd rather hear somebody play their own shit and, and embrace the concept behind what those guys did. And do their right. own. I, I don't mean their own thing like totally original because nobody's nobody's totally original anymore and hasn't been for eons. But but the idea is to come up with your own slant on things so it doesn't sound like like I don't care if someone can play a Michael Brecker solo on the bass. I would say that's really impressive. But after listening to about thirty bars of it, I go like, well, that you know, great. Now what what can what do you do? Right. You know what's your story? You know. Yeah, no, I, I've kind of always had that mentality too. And then probably because of Eddie Van Halen, because he always preached, do your own thing. Yeah. Don't try to copy what I do, you know, yeah. which, which was a, amazing for a, a rock sort of guitar player to, to be preaching yeah. to people. Whether people actually listen to him or not was a whole yeah. different thing. But, but I mean, you know, like, I mean, what, what, like doing the whole thing where you, you know, you emulate something. Adam Nussbaum, this great jazz drummer. Have you ever yep. played with him? Yeah. No, yeah. no, no. Great guy, wonderful player. Yeah. Anyway, he did this clinic at uh, Humber College a few years ago, and one of the things he said. Now I don't know if, if he he might have heard this from someone else. Anyway, it's three words that really sum up everything in terms of development. Let me see if I can get this right now. So he said, "Oh yeah, so it's emulate." Said so step one. You hear something. You know, you're a child, you hear your parents, mama, dada, you, you emulate what you hear. You integrate. In other words, you make it part of your vocabulary, whatever it is you're emulating. Then you innovate. In other words, so you take the vocabulary, and again, you take the conceptual idea behind it, and then run with it and mix it all up. And what I mean by innovate is, I don't mean innovate like Bill Evans did or, or Herbie, or a chick, but what you do is you, in terms of your own musical direction, you're innovating because you're creating things that you haven't done before. Yep. And you're following, you're going off on different tangents, and so that's that's like innovating within whatever parameters you're currently comfortable in. You're you're uh, reinventing things, and that's essentially what we what we try and do, right? We hear something, we you know, at, at the beginning formative years, we copy it. Oh, you know, what's what's Clapton doing with that blues lick? Then, and then you you know you get it down and then you forget about it and then in a certain situation maybe on another tune maybe even a, on a different type of chord progression that will just come out so you're, you're sort of innovating or improvising yeah and uh, that that really that sort of sums it up it, it's just like the way you're talking to me now you didn't have everything you just said written out <laughs> no you, no that's what I, yeah yeah that's what I mean it's like you know like that's what that's what I love about jazz music you know you could play the same tune three times in a row, and each time, it's like you're going up to a blackboard that's full of information, or like an etch a sketch, and you shake it. Yep. And all of a sudden, hey, you've got a brand new uh, blank canvas, blank screen, exactly. Yeah. And away you go. No, I agree. Well, I that, I always have that linking it to language as well. Like absolutely. When when, when you uh, when you popped out of your mother's womb, they didn't put a book in front of you okay now we're going to teach you how to talk that's right yeah um yeah we listen we listen and we emulate and we re then we learn to react right you know, so yeah it's it's fascinating the whole to me the whole process is absolutely 
fascinating, which is why I practice for hours a day, even now. I'm actually more passionate about music now than I was even when I was first getting into jazz. That's and I great. I was very passionate then. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, for some reason, since the pandemic, I, I haven't really been that inspired to practice a whole lot. Yeah. I don't know I, what well, it I've is. I've always but... been, yeah, I, I don't know. Everybody's different, of course. But I've, yeah. I've always been very, very self-motivated. I've always been that way. Even when I first heard Crossroads, the first time I heard Crossroads, and I went, what? What is that? <laughs> You know? Well, practicing is a, is a you know a very personal path, to some extent. Um, yeah, it's not the same for everyone. No, um, absolutely. You know, I know you've gone through, as you mentioned, just phases of hours and hours of practicing, even though sometimes life gets in the way of practicing or whatever. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, do you have any advice for people when it comes to get the most out of their practice? Well. I think if, if I think looking at I mean you can look at practice routines or practice uh, sessions from a, a couple of different angles you know like let's say you know you could you can make part of your practice routine well there, here's one thing that, that, that I, I tell students sometimes get a piece of paper and write up write up a, a, a list or just put a line in the middle of it and in the, in the left side, you know, write out some conceptual ideas and, and devices that you are very comfortable using that you can already do. And then think of some other things that you think you should be able to do or would like to be able to do and put that on the other side. And then systematically, and, and they don't have to be in any rank order. You know, like if your reading's weak, you write in the right column, you write, work on sight reading. Duh. Yep. Do it every day for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, you know. Uh, if you're weak on chord scale relations or you, you only know four voicings <laughs> or you only know or you only know two tunes, you know, et cetera, et cetera or, you, yep. or you don't know the fretboard very well, make up a list and don't work on the shit that you know, you know. I mean, that's what I did when I was a teenager. I knew my four or five Eric Clapton, B.B. King looks, and I kept playing them over and over and over. And I thought... I, I don't, what, what is it? And then when I heard jazz and heard this whole other world, it made me want to learn all these other things. I realized, like you were saying earlier, there's this whole other big, wonderful world out there. So yeah. you need you need to, you know, you need to be inspired by listening to different things and then hearing things that sort of turn your crank and say like, wow, that's really great. I have no idea what they're doing. I should investigate this, you know. But anyway, yeah, so you figure out what you can do, what you can't do, and then start attacking that. That's one thing. And again, it could be, you know, working on a, odd time signatures, you know, tunes in different keys, open string voicings. I mean, it's, you know, there's a litany of things that you can do. Yeah, it's endless. <laughs> oh, yeah, but that's what's great about it, though. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I think that's wonderful. Years and years ago, I found that very daunting. Now I just go, like, this gives me another ex reason to pick up my guitar, you know. Right, yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's one thing. And then there's the whole thing about repertoire development. That's, the, you know, that's a whole other uh, deal. And then... But then, you know, so once you sort of, you know, you're figuring out the things that you, you can do and then the things you can't do, or take the things you can do and do them in another key. Take all the things you are, take giant steps, take moments notice, and very, very, very slowly try playing them in another key. You know, you analyze the progression, it's, you know, different things like that. Uh, and then also, um, you can um, make part of your practice routine as if you're performing. That's a that's a good one, yeah. Yeah, in other words, in other words, don't start and, uh, you know, for that shit I'm talking about. What I just mentioned, that stuff, you know, you can start and stop as much as you want because you're trying to perfect things, yep. right? Now, in the real world, you know, even when you're jamming with people or whatever, uh, you know, you, you you've got to keep going. The show, the sort of thing, have the attitude. The show must go on, sort of. <laughs> yeah. So play like you're yeah. playing in a club, and if you make a mistake or you, or something unintentional comes out. Don't stop and say, what was that? God, that was terrible. Just move on from there and keep going. Yeah, you have to forget it. And it even happened. Yeah, Just, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so that, uh, that's that's the that's the sort of uh, the real sort of died in the wool improvisational part. Like actually sit down and just like say, I'm going to forget about all the crap I was working on. And I'm going to be like a kid in a playground. And I'm just going to have fun. And I'm just going to play. Right. That's why they call it playing. It's right. supposed to be fun. Yeah, it's <laughs> not work. 
no, no. I mean, it's serious, but it's it, yeah. but it has to have a huge element of fun and yeah. personal joy and learning and and all that stuff. And you know. Yeah. No, I agree. And we have to learn how to inspire ourselves. We can't always be externally. I I think most of the inspiration, not all, of course, but a lot of it, ideally comes from inside us. I really I really believe that. Yeah. You know. No, I was hoping you were going to say something like that because I agree. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean yeah. yeah, I mean you can't sort of sit around and like I mean I, to be honest with you, I hate to say this, but I rarely listen to music anymore. I'm I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah. I'm always practicing. Yeah. And, and I've got so many things that I want to work on, and so many tunes I want to learn, and the whole thing about finding the right, um, like currently my one of my favorite keys. Well, my favorite keys are the sharp keys. But not like for playing blues, like like three chord blues. It's like the piano keys. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and the uh, well, but the because the way the guitar is tuned, like in the standard tuning, there, there's so many things you can do with open strings in the sharp keys, and yeah. I'm forever trying to discover voicings, and they're not all like five and six note voicings. Sometimes it's two notes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm so I'm going back and I'm and I'm playing a lot of tunes in different keys. Sometimes I'll play them. I'll go up in semitones and I'll play them in 12 keys and I'll mess around with them and look for different shapes. And then I might try taking a tune that's, uh, you know, I'll take all these standard tunes and I'll play them in five or seven. That's something right. I've been doing for the last few years. And I'll do them on gigs like that sometimes. And again, I, I don't do it because it's the hip thing to do. I do it because it gets, for me, it's kind of a bullshit filter. You know, we all have our own licks and things that, that our hands naturally do owing to muscle memory. Mm -hmm. So if you if you take all the things you are and you play it in five or seven, you've got to be very cognizant in terms of where you are. And then also thinking about not just the standard changes, but with some optional, because um, you're, you're dealing in a different framework, some different, uh, you know, adding extra chord change, like maybe adding some, uh, you know, chromatic two fives or, you know, the tritone subs and, you know, different, reharmonizing the chord qualities, reharmonizing the melody, uh, same root, but different type of chord, etc. Anyway, those are all things that I, uh, most of my practicing these days is blowing on tunes. And I, but I try and take some of the conceptual ideas, theoretical ideas and use them. Like what, if I was, let's say I was working on diminished harmony, mm -hmm. know, like half hole or whatever. I'm not going to sit here and just play like patterns. I, I can't, I, I just can't do that. What I would do is I would play something approximating some patterns, but I would do it while I would be improvising on a tune. Right. And probably just little snippets. You're not going to yeah, be yeah, playing yeah. a pattern I, yeah. over and over yeah, and yeah, over. Yeah. And over. I mean, if I wanted to get really anal about it, I could, I could play for the first chord of all the things instead of this, I could play this or this. Right. And then I could play some corresponding, you know, a diminished thing on it. You know, I could go, you know, like, and then go to the next chord. That's that's why I like playing in a trio setting because you can sort of dictate the harmony a little easier. Exactly, the yeah. bass player. You don't even have to tell the bass player anything because I right. mean they, they play things other than roots, but it, everything's everything kind of revolves around like the framework revolves around the root, root to root. So if you know, if you know that a minor third on a minor chord can be reharmed as a sharp nine, if there's a natural third, right away you're getting a different sound, and then harmonically you could back that up with some different scalar ideas. Or, or you know. yeah, that's one thing that Lenny used to do all the time. Oh yeah, he, yeah, Lenny was amazing. Lenny and Ed were great for changes. Lenny came up with some beautiful uh, uh, chord progression. But I would try and do that. I I would actually take. You know, I would look at the instrument, or I, would, I like to shut my eyes when I play, too, because I can see, you know, anybody that's been playing for a while, you can see the fretboard, you can mm -hmm. visualize it, you know. And I look for different... Uh, also, I try and approach playing... When I'm playing by myself, I'm trying to approach playing it not as if I had a bass player, but I would start throwing in roots. You know, I might go like... Uh, <laughs> And you've been doing that for years, right? Yeah. yeah. So 
it sort of sounds like I'm tr what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to approximate what Bill Evans might do. Right. Where he's not playing. He's not playing all the bass notes and all the voicings and all the linear ideas all at the same time. They're mm -hmm. interspersed. Yeah, it gives it gives the uh, the ear time to hear the different elements. Yeah, and it, it, you know what? It's sort of and when you're a guitar player, you have to do. It's almost like being a magician as opposed to a musician. You're sort of <laughs> dealing with smoke and mirrors. You're creating the illusion that there's three people playing in yep. a way because you got some bass notes here then you got a bit of like uh, comping shots and then you got some linear ideas and they're all happening sometimes at the same time and then off of one another and then if you start getting into some like different rhythmic groupings like three beat five beat seven beat figures or whatever throwing in tritone two fives changing the quality playing broken up arpeggio it starts to sound like a piano yeah i mean like a pianistic approach or or an electric piano right. so that's the kind of thing that i I sort of hear it that way, and I've been working towards that for many, many, like a long time. And I'm and I'm still working at it because that, like, it's not like I've got it together. Far from it. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like um, they hand you a chisel and a hammer, and there's Mount Everest. Start chipping away at the, yeah, all yeah. the information that there is that you could possibly learn. Yeah, or someone gives yeah. you this very, very rough diamond, and with a chisel, and they say, "Okay, here's this really, really rough-looking, shiny thing here." You know, make something out of this. Right. And it's so we, you and I, have been chiseling for many years. Yeah. And we're going to keep chiseling. Right. That is true. Yeah. 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 So that's what. Uh, that's kind of the deal. Can I ask you about uh, kind of almost maybe almost leading back to uh, playing with Ed? Mm -hmm. Is like one of the hardest things for guitar players to do is to play in a duo setting. Because you know you have there's a tendency to step on each other's toes, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, you have just, any? Oh, like, do you mean two guitars without any bass and drums, or to just is that like a duo? Either or. or. Yeah, because okay, it still well, can it can still happen, but. Oh, uh, well, for sure. Yeah. Well, if you're doing a duo without the benefit of bass, then both guitar players have to have a really good handle. You know, and you know this on on the. Like the, one way to not get in the way of, of another guitar player is to start off with, uh, uh, you know, building your chords, you know, with like chord shells and of course other notes added. But th the thing that would uh, sort of, um, let's see now, I guess your, your one's cue for what you would be playing. Again, this is happening in real time, right? Where you don't sit there and go like, uh, what voicing should I play? What, <laughs> yeah. what line are you going to be playing here so I can harmonize uh -huh. it properly? Right. You know, it's all on the fly. But it, first of all, it, you have to know, number one, you both have to know the melody really well. I mean, that's a given. And you both have to know like a good sort of standard, solid harmonic framework. Then after that, you, I have to, if I'm accompanying somebody, I have to spend more time, pay more attention to them than to me. Right. So it's very important to not be self-indulgent. Like don't, yeah. get, in other words, don't get into your own head, get into their head and really try and, and, and not figure out, but like react and, and, you know, there's a term called selflessness. In other words, you're trying to, and I'm not like into Zen or meditation or anything like that, but the idea is where you're, you're observing things that are happening around you. And of course, when you're playing in a musical situation with another guitarist, I guess in this case, you know, your, your, um, your number one goal and your number one priority is to support and, and feed the other soloist and give them something to play off of without dictating to them and without getting in their way and without compromising what they're doing. Right. Which, so that means sometimes it's, you know, it's not about always going, you know, like, um, not, you know, like it's not know. trying to be as hip as you can. <laughs> yeah. And it's not about going, yeah, exactly. And it's not about going like, right. Yeah. So then it has Unless to it calls for it or something. Well, no, for sure. If somebody, yeah, I mean, if you're playing with like, um, who's that cat? Frank Viola, Viola, or there's some right. cats in New York. It's like a, you know, it's it's a cool style. It's not really my cup of tea, but it's very, it's much more traditional from a rhythmic perspective. Yeah. Well, sometimes I'll do that sort of Freddie Green types comping just for 
four measures or something or oh no for sure no there's nothing wrong with it at all uh in the right situation but yeah but you wouldn't want to do it for like a long time and sort of have that as your sort of stylistic default well things start to get pretty clunky when you (laughs) Well, yeah, when yeah. you're just laying down the quarter notes. Well, that's all the time. right. So yeah, so and so if you take like really basic harmony, but then think about like breaking it up, you know, like um, in other words, you can leave all yeah. kinds of space. And still accompany them, and still giving them some support. If anything, you're giving them some room. You're, you're, you're letting right. them breathe. You're letting them breathe a little bit. Well, and then of course you can go into the walking baseline thing too. But again, I wouldn't want to do that for an entire. Right. Too. So, so the big thing is really, really, uh, like, don't think at all about what you're doing. Think of, like, just listen and react to what they're doing. And there's That's, a great way to practice that. What, you know, I mean, what you can do, I mean, one thing a, a, an individual can do is you can record um, a, a linear solo that, that has space in it, of course, and play it, play it back and just play it and start accompanying it. And that, you don't that's have time. Good advice, yeah. yeah, you don't have to, you don't have time to analyze. So was that the ninth? Was that the third? Was that the fifth? Maybe I should have played that voicing. Just do it and do it over and over and over. And then another thing you can do is try, try and play an alternate line, not an not like an alternate melody line, but like try and play as if you were you were playing a, a linear duet. Because sometimes right. guitar players like play a lines. counter melody. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, you know yeah. sometimes like, like if I was playing with another guitar player, sometimes instead of just trading, we would actually play lines together. Yeah, I've done that before well, too. For yeah. sure, it's it's a, yeah. it's it's a lot of fun. But then again, you want you don't want it to sound like you've got this baffle between you and you're ignoring each other. You know, right. there's got to be a, a, a feeling of communication and flow and chemistry and all that. So so in order to be able to do that effectively, you really have to uh, uh, you've got to like just listen like crazy. You know, you've got to have like the you've got to have those ra- old style radar dishes that are floating around. <laughs> Constantly on on uh, on on go, yeah. Yeah. Um, w- when you were playing with Ed back in the day, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm sure it probably felt like it, it was he was elevating your playing just from the like what we were talking about his huge ears and and giving you space oh, to do stuff too, right? Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the only way for anybody to get better at what they do, like if you're a musician, is to play with people that are stronger than you, that are more accomplished than you, that are more experienced than you. And just by virtue of osmosis and sort of being thrown into uh, like a friendly lion's den, you know, you you, uh, you get the adrenaline going and you, you, and you get inspired and you, um, you know, you rise to the occasion, hopefully. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I know the, the few times that I've played uh, with Don Thompson, Mm-hmm. When I still lived in Toronto, right? It, it was very much like that. He would provide this like amazing cushion of time, exactly. and, yeah, and, it, yeah. and I just felt everything seemed so easy. And yeah, I, I, I bet you if someone videotaped me, I might, I had a grin from ear to ear. Oh, I don't doubt it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. It's um, it's it's inspiring. And when you're inspired, you know, you soar. You 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 want to just sort of, you know, you want to take off or like you know, left not to sound corny, but like a greater heights or great greater heights than you're used to achieving. Yeah, when I listened to your first recording that came out on Pablo, right? I, I you know, you kind of alluded this to this as well, but um, you know, I definitely hear a lot of Ed in there. Oh yeah, and 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 a little bit of Lenny isms some mm-hmm. in there, but uh, there wasn't the Bill Evans influence yet, right? That's right. Um, and I know that's a big part of your approach now. When when did Bill Evans start becoming a big influence on your playing? Uh, let's see. Well, that album, that, that recording was done in April of 1980. I'd say, I'd say a year or two later, I was starting to listen to more of Bill Evans uh, in, in a you know, in a fairly regular way, and then really kind of, uh, you know, just again, being blown away by something that was just so, I mean, not only technically incredible, but much more than that, 
just so inventive. Yeah. So imaginative. So rhythmically varied. Uh, so so rhythmically strong. So articulate. So confident. So um, the touch, the voicings. Uh, I had never heard any kind of piano playing like that before. Just like yeah. when I heard Ed, I had never heard anything like that before. When I heard Lenny, same thing. Or Charlie Parker. I mean, it's just another, just another sort of iconic figure that whose style was just so, uh, and concept was so crystallized. Yet again, in a state of uh, evolution or development, you hear like Bill's last recordings with his last trio, and then you hear his playing. It's, it's beautiful. It's got all those same qualities, but it's it's evolved somehow, yeah. you know, it's, as as it should. Right. You know. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, but we, you know, it's interesting do, yeah. though how some players never did. Well, yeah, I mean, even like on different instruments. Yeah, know. even I would say even Dizzy Gillespie, not as much necessarily. No, no definitely not. And someone like uh, Joe Pass, who was a wonderful player sort of sounded like Joe Pass his whole life. Yeah. And, I, and not to denigrate, or someone like Herb Ellis, or someone like Barney Kessel, or Charlie Bird, or, um, and, and, you know, people on other instruments, uh, you know, as well, uh, where they just, to them, the process of development, I mean, it's not something that you can force. It's just, it's just, an, it's just, you know, you're, you're, everybody's on a path. Sometimes right. the, the path will have different, uh, um, few curves in it here and there, you know, mm -hmm. and and it's and uh, or uh, you know, a good, like I said, different tangents are going off on some uh, um, sort of little side trips in a way, and which leads to uh, you know different types of development and uh, uh, conceptual, um, not not conceptual improvement. That's a really bad way of saying it, but just um, how one's conceptions will. Yeah, they'll just evolve. They'll change. And, you know, like with the idea is you, you have certain things in your playing that are inherent in your playing. And you retain some of these things naturally. And then other things like fall by the wayside. Yeah, yeah I, there's a friend of mine, um, George Muscatello, a great uh -huh. guitar player in, um, uh, in around the uh, Albany area. Right. And we used to teach at a guitar workshop in Toronto every year. Yeah. And he goes, every time I come to... to every year you sound com like a completely different person. And I'm like, okay, cool. Right. Uh, but the thing I have to say that, uh, about that first recording is that it still sounds like you, like there's still th that thread of you w that I can listen to way back then. It still right. sounds like you, even though you sound different and have, and have evolved and all that stuff. Yeah. But that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Like, it's yeah. Just, like, yeah. So it's not about the product, like IE recording. It's about the yeah. process and it's just, and the process just keeps, it almost has like a life of its own, right? Really, you know what I mean. So like no, I know. Like, I, yeah, that that makes perfect sense. I yeah, I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not, and it's nothing that you know. It, it, you don't wake up one day and say, you know, I'm I'm going to be, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to start trying to sound like a complete original, uh, completely original player. Well, I mean, I you know, I could I could go like you know, say, well, that sounds original. Well, it's not. It's actually a chord that Jim Hall once played. <laughs> But right. but um, but you know, I come up with something that just sounds really weird and really different. Well, what good is that? Is weird and different the way it should be? It's got to be something that you hear, something that you're passionate about, something that inspires you, uh, something that um, you know, something that reflects who you are to a certain degree, or your perspective on things, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you can't you can't you know. I mean, I'll tell you, I, you know, the first time I heard Lenny Bro, I was falling asleep one school night. I was in high school, and there was a show on uh, a local radio station. There was a guy named Terry David Mulligan had a show. It was called The Open Lid. Yeah, he's been, he was in radio for a long time. Uh, he was yeah. in radio, and then he got into the, he, TV. Then he became a yeah. VJ, you know, video yeah. disc jockey. That's, that's well, when I got to know him, like when, when videos were popular in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, when Lenny Bro did the, uh, when he went like... Uh, played the that's all some yep. people go to school trying to learn how to teach you know and then yeah you know, and he did that i 
I can't do it very well. The Travis picking on, and he did, did this old tune. I think it's by Merle Haggard, maybe. It's called That's All. Uh, anyway, Merle yeah, Travis. I, Merle I Travis so. song. I think yeah. so, yeah. Anyway, the way Lenny played it, at the end, he started playing all these beautiful voicings and harmonics, and I just, I sat up in bed as I was falling asleep, and I thought, wow, that's another, I said, man, what is that? This is from another planet. And he sang, and he had that kind of funny, sort of nasally voice, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I didn't find out who it was until about a year or two later, I happened to be, because he didn't mention, oh, that was Lenny Bro, live at Shelley's Manhole which I think is his best recording ever, bar none, hmm. for, for my money anyway. Uh, and um, anyway, so yeah, a couple of years later, within a year or two, I was at a party and someone happened to put that record on. I went, what is that? They said, that's Lenny Bro. I said, man, I heard that shit two years ago. I said, had I known, I would have gone to Sam the Record Man the next day right. and bought the record. Now I'm two years behind. Oh, yeah. But it's just <laughs> no. funny. But, but, but again, this whole idea of like evolution, I heard that, and that, that's one of those little, not a bump in the road, but a curve in the road yeah. that made me. And that right around that time is when I, then I realized where Lenny got his concept from. Not with, the country stuff, because that Bill. was obvious. Right. right. And then I got into Bill through hearing Lenny. Oh, speaking of which, it just popped into my mind. Were you at the gig in Toronto when Lenny and Bill Evans played together? No, no. That was at the Town Tavern. That was before my time. Okay. A little bit, yeah. I, I've only seen, like, pictures. Uh, me too. Yeah, yeah but... Yeah. Uh... yeah, and apparently, like, Bill laid out, though, for most of it, because Lenny was playing all his shit on the guitar. There was no room for Bill to comp. Right. And Bill just sat there and was, I think, yeah, he must have been, like, incredibly impressed with what Lenny was doing. He was probably thinking, "Wow, he sounds like me on the guitar." <laughs> probably, yeah. Yeah, well, he did. That—that that was his goal. He wanted he, Bill yeah. was his guy, you know, and he, that's why he played all those Bill tunes. And no, he started growing his hair long and wearing glasses like Bill Evans. Yeah, it and, started. Yeah. yeah, it started looking like a real, real hippie. Um, back to your uh, your first album that you created. You know, I jokingly asked you about the reverb pedal and stuff, but I know um, because on Blue and Green. Yeah. There, what is it? What is that? Like a, a, a flanger pedal or something? No, it was a chorus pedal. I think. Oh, it is chorus. Okay. Oh no, maybe it wasn't. Maybe, maybe it was a phase shifter. I can't remember now. Like an electro harmonics or something? Yeah, it was either a, an MXR phase shifter, but I'm pretty sure it was one of those little blue chorus. Uh, it's probably a boss pedal. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, because what, what I was trying to do was I was trying to, like, uh, I heard Bill play a couple of tunes on the Fender Rhodes. Mm -hmm. And he used the vibrato on the Fender Rhodes. And you got that, and then you got that kind of chorusing effect. Yeah. So I they're, was trying well, to emulate. Well, they're almost very similar, the vibrato and the chorus. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I was trying to emulate that on that one tune on Blue and Green. Yeah. And, <laughs> but yeah, but um, and, and for a while, I mean, I played with I played with bit with Vito and uh, this guy Dave Antonacci in Toronto. That writes jingles and writes like some nice kind of melodic fusion music. This was like it's got to be like 35 years ago or more. And for a while, I had one of those little Boss pedal boards. Yeah. And I used it for off and on for maybe a year, and then, then I gave it to a friend of mine, a great drummer's son. I said, I don't, I'm not into this anymore. So I did dabble in it, but I, 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 I you know, because I yeah. came out of the rock thing too. Yeah. You know, I was into like, you know, some overdrive and all that shit. But, but uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I, I've done, matter of fact, you, that you brought, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about Vito Rezza. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I did a gig with, with Vito, the uh, the jazz bistro. Right. A few years ago. Uh huh. And uh, we were in like in the green room or whatever. And he was telling me that, that, that you asked him about stuff that he does, like, odd time groupings and odd time signatures and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you imp implement that? Because I, I, I remember hearing recordings and seeing you live and just like, whoa, he's like playing, you're playing these phrases that are going way over the bar line and these really cool rhythmic uh, groupings and stuff. Oh, but, well. but, but the thing is, it always sounded really musical. It didn't sound like math or... And clinical in some yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that stuff can sound yeah very clinical and very cold and very calculated. And uh, 
Well, you know, one, I mean, you know what? Bill Evans did some incredibly rhythmic things. I mean, way like compared to like people at the, you know, other musicians at the time, a piano and otherwise, you know. But um, yeah, so I, I listened a lot to, to Bill in four, and he would do a lot of things with quarter note triplets, and he was really into displacing things, taking things that normally would start and stop on certain beats, and he would shift them, you know. So that was one thing that I really kind of was like checked out. And then his, his uh, ability to play in 3-4 and make it sound like he was playing in 2 or, or four, 4 yeah, or 6 yeah. or, or six, and get that lovely over the bar line thing. So I actually made myself a cassette. This is, oh God, this is going back to like, oof, this is probably like 1978, 79. I made myself a cassette from all these different Bill Evans records I had of only 3-4 tunes that he recorded recorded quite a few of them and I just listened to it I didn't lift one thing I just listened and counted and listened and listened and a lot of it rubbed off on me but and then I experimented with like put on a metronome and instead of putting on a metronome like you know uh, three clicks to a bar I what I would do is I would have it in groups of two I don't have a metronome here in front of me. So you're feeling that three over two kind of thing. Yeah, kind yeah. of. Well, yeah, instead of going like, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, I would go one, two, three, one, two, three. Oh, one, I see. Two. Okay. As a matter of fact, on the album I did on Jazz Inspiration, I recorded this original tune, kind of a silly tune. It, I called it Waltz You Needn't. Yep. Because it was sort of loosely based on the changes of Well You Needn't, but it was in 3 4. And I had. I remember the engineer, Mike Farquharson, a great electric bass player. Oh, I know Mike well, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I haven't seen him for years. but Yeah, yeah he's been at Berkeley for a thousand years. So we, we hooked up in, in, uh, out in, the, in uh, Whistler, B.C. a few years ago at some music festival. Anyway, he, he, to, he reminded me, he says, man, I'll never forget when you were, recorded this waltz and you, and you told me to put the click on, on two and four. He said that was so weird, but I was I wasn't hearing it as two and four. I was hearing it. I was hearing alternate beats. Yeah. In, you know, in three, like one, two, like the way a drummer might do that to get that over the bar line thing. Right. Right. So the drummer would go one, two, three, a one, two, three, a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. and then every two bars it resets. So mm -hmm. I was trying to use that as sort of a, a window into playing things that would go over the bar line. So it wouldn't be like boom, check, check, boom, check, check, right? It's like sort mm -hmm. of dissolving the bar line in a way. Yeah. And right. I and I, uh, I sort of learned that or was exposed to that by listening very intently to a lot of Bill Evans uh, uh, recordings where he does that. And then also think about different ways of playing uh, triplets. Like Bill Evans would sometimes, instead of playing triplets, always starting on the downbeat, he would start it on an upbeat. You know, he might do something like... Instead of going like one, two, three, he might go one, two, three. Right? Yeah. So right away everything's being pushed, being anticipated, right? And it, it gives creates movement. Forward right? motion. Exactly. And then yeah. some of the three beat figures that he would play. He didn't play a whole lot of five beat or seven beat figures. His his big thing was the three beat thing. It was her beat. Herbie Hancock really started doing that regularly, the five and the seven with Miles. Um, but so I and I was, you know, of course, listening to Miles and listening to some of those recordings too. And, yeah, uh, I remember uh, I got um, at the. T I mean, it's probably prevalent all over YouTube or whatever now. But I remember at the time it was like gold to th that you got this because it had the time stamps in it. Pat LaBarbera, watching this, he gave me a video. Yeah. That, that of miles in in germany right and and you can tell like herbie's going for it and he's trying all those kinds of things and and it sounds like like he's lost at some point and then just miles like boom here we're gonna come in here now <laughs> yeah 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 well but, no but, but My, miles miles told all everybody in the band he said i'm not paying you guys to to uh, to like to, to to play the same shit i'm playing you i'm paying you to practice improvise try right. things you know, yeah, no, um, that's uh, a good band leader to have. Yeah, someone who was an encourage. You know, it's sort of like that. What was that that cartoon for kids years ago, The Magic School Bus, where the the teacher was said, you know, get messy, make mistakes, because mm -hmm. mistakes are learning opportunities, right? Yeah. 
absolutely. So for sure. anyway, so a lot of that stuff is just stuff that I, I was, that I got through osmosis by listening to Bill. And of course, I would put on a metronome and I would practice improvising that way. But I wouldn't start and stop and say, now I'm going to play triplets grouped in fours. I'm going to. I would just start hearing it and slowly. Again, I would always try and implement it or apply it to a song as quickly as possible. Right, so it had a musical. So there was a musical intent, as opposed to like learning a lick. Right. You know that kind of a thing. So that's that's very important to me. Can you can you talk a little bit about what it was like playing with Oscar Peterson? Because probably, as a jazz musician, it's almost like all of a sudden you're playing with Sting in the in, in the uh, rock realm. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. Oh no, I know he was a superstar for sure. Yeah. Well, when I played with Oscar, well, I played with him a, li a little bit in the in the early '80s after he produced that record. I did a couple little gigs with him, and then I went out west with him and Dave Young, just to, to some hotel uh, in Edmonton, and uh, so that was then. And then when I played with him in the '90s, prior to that, he went back on the road, but he had a stroke and he was debilitated for quite a while, and then he wanted to reform his band or a band or whatever. Uh, then he asked me, I was at this function, and he happened to be there, and he just asked me to, to join his group, I guess. So I said, oh, amazing, thank you. And uh, yeah, so playing with him it, on certain tunes, I would be like, he would, his left hand was very debilitated. Yeah. He could, he could play at slower tempos, he could find some voicings and things. At faster tempos, he would just sort of do this, but nothing was happening. It was a physical thing, you know. Yeah. So in many ways, a lot of times I would be filling in chords and things like that, you know, things something like, you know, like the standard, you know, like um, just to fill in that harmonic. Yeah. And he used to call those things like big band shout chorus chords, you know, where the, where oh, okay. the you know, before the, the, the head would come back in in a big band, you know, you know, you hear it. You know, that kind of a thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that would change, that would, that would happen along those lines. Not on ballads, obviously. He would he would be able to comp on ballads, and he came on ballads. He would play some beautiful voicings, and uh, and I'd have to sort of sit there with whatever hearing I had at the time and and uh, play a solo based on what he was playing for me. He had perfect pitch, but a lot of times he would sort of do, you know, he was the leader of the band, and sometimes he would kind of let you know it. In <laughs> yeah. a way. You know, could, he could, could play whatever shit he wanted, and it was his gig. So, you know, right. so I would have to, you know, I had to sort of fall in, and uh, but it worked. It seemed to work fine. I never really clashed with him. Right. And uh, yeah, so, and I learned a lot. You know, I mean, uh, getting back to the whole thing about listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's know, what I was going to ask you. What yeah, you like learned was, from playing with him? Yeah, like when he was playing stuff, you know, if he was comping at a slower tempo, he would still want me to do stuff. So I had to find a hole somewhere. And even if there wasn't a hole, something that would complement what he was doing. And I had to do that when I played with Joey DeFrancesco, too, mm -hmm. who's an incredible organ player and a wonderful guy, very incredibly talented. It's amazing. But the same thing when you play with, you know, when you play with an organ player, you sometimes you'll play at the same time and you better have something that's going to be compatible. <laughs> and then also you wait for the holes and then you kind of respond and fill it in uh, right. accordingly. So. Yeah, again, it all comes down to listening. It's all listening, you know. So it was a great experience in that regard, for sure. You know? And then we did those three records. And uh, same thing. you got to, like, just keep the radar on and, and uh, hope for the best. <laughs> right. You know, so. At the end of a, and one of those gigs, you're probably mentally tired. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, if you had to choose doing a gig... With a crampy, a crappy amp versus a crappy guitar, but you had you couldn't have both, or like like a good guitar and a good amp. What would you choose? I would probably go. I would choose the crappy guitar. Oh yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. And, and this did well, actually, and, and this didn't happen to me, but it, hap it happened to Ed, and I was there. I did a little mini tour of Spain with Neil Swainson and the late great Jerry Fuller. Mm -hmm. And we did three little concerts there. And the first concert we played, we got to Spain, and Ed shows up in, in the, at the hotel. And he said that the guitar, his guitar didn't arrive. It's coming on a later plane for some stupid reason. So the, the, the guy, Fabio Mijano, very good piano player, lives in Spain, lived in Toronto for quite a while. He and Neil Swainson and I were driving through this town called Alicante, where, where Fabio lived at the time, looking for a guitar for Ed. <laughs> and it was really slim pickings. Right. We finally found this old Hagstrom Swede. It was just not very good. It was playable, but... My first, get, my first electric guitar was a Hagstrom. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah I like their guitars, actually. And I, I played at Hagstrom Swede when it was set up right. It was a pretty, pretty good guitar. Larry Coriel actually endorsed them for a while, a million years ago. Okay. Anyway, we so we found this Hagstrom Swede. And it was not in very good shape at all. I mean, like, you know, the electronics were working and stuff, but it wasn't set up all that great. And, you know, it was kind of beat up. And, and uh, not the kind of guitar you would think that, you know, a, a jazz player would want to use anyway. So uh, so I, I made the offer. That's all we could find. So I made the offer. And I said, Ed, if you want to play my guitar, I mean, it's in good playing condition. And he says, no, no, I'll just deal with it for the one concert. Well, as I recall... He sounded exactly like Ed Bickert, right? <laughs> right? So if it's a crappy guitar, but it's playable, I'd much rather have that and have a decent amp than have cool. a good guitar and a shitty amp. Yeah, um, everybody's probably different. For yeah. me, I, I think I might, well, especially for me, if I'm playing my seven string, there's probably not too many seven strings with a high A. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, that's, I would rather have probably that and then deal with a crappy amp. Yeah, but, well, I, uh, I, I hear you on that for sure. Yeah. But like, you know, I sort of, I firmly believe that one's sound, whatever it is, it's coming from an internal source. Yeah. So if you have a guitar that isn't your guitar, you can still sound like you because it's not so much the sound of the guitar, it's one's conception and one's of dialing it in. Yeah, yeah. And you, then you, you touch, figure out yeah. a way of yeah, because you're it's actually it's not coming from here. It's coming from here. Mm -hmm. You know? So unless so I mean unless the guitar is literally unplayable, that's a different story. But if it's not a very good guitar and it's not set up great, you can still figure out a way of making it getting your conception out. Right. Such as it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, that's why cool. Yeah, uh, um, and Jim Hall mentioned something about that many years ago. He talked about like the fact that the sound there's a sound that we we hear in our head, and we try and we figure out a way of trying to get to it. I, you know, so it, 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 it so it becomes external, but it originates internally. Yeah, from a, I remember from a very early age, I didn't really I hated hearing a tinny trebly sound i yeah. always dialed in at what yeah. i thought was a full sound yeah. even right from when i was early gigging you know is there anything that you regret that you did or didn't do in your earlier years earlier years music related or not uh well when i was much younger i sort of uh, re I, I, at first i i kind of regretted the fact that I didn't discover jazz at an earlier age. Same like here. Got, and, <laughs> no, and got like, I mean, it got really, really serious about it. Yeah. I got really serious about it when I was about, uh, like I said, I, you know, I, I took some lessons with Tony Braden when I was 16, but again, it had really nothing to do with, with jazz. You know, it was like just fingerboard, mechanical fingerboard things. So yeah, it would have been nice if I actually, Maybe if I was 14, I remember I had a good friend named Raymond Applebaum, a, a trumpet player, sort of, you know, high school trumpet player, or just, yeah, or junior high, and he put on my he put on the Miles Davis album. I was probably about 14, maybe 13 or 14, and that's the kind of blue. 
No, he put on oh. My Funny Valentine from oh, Lincoln okay. Center, you know, which mm -hmm. is incredible. Well, they're all incredible albums. And I said, man, and I and he played, uh, he played My Funny, he played Stella, I think, and, and My Funny Valentine. And Miles sounded like he had spit in his horn, and, and I, I couldn't hear the expression and, and the beauty in what he was doing. And I said to him after about five minutes, I said, man, this guy, this guy can't play the trumpet. I said, he's a, he's a wanker. I said, put on some Hendrix. And I wish that day that the switch would have gone off. And I said, man, that's incredible. I don't get it, but it's unbelievable. It right. was years later where I really, a few years later, three or four years later, where it was like, this it's, is the shit. It's you know? funny you mentioned that because when I first started hearing Jimi Hendrix, I thought, well, this guy can't play. He's sloppy and everything. <laughs> right, but yeah. now, much later in life, yeah. I really appreciate what he was doing, you know? Yeah, well, and the soulfulness. And the, yeah. you know, I mean, it, for his, he was incredible for what he did, for sure. Yeah. Well, but yeah, I mean, yeah. So other than that, but I mean, you know what? I mean, we, we come to things when we come to things. Yeah. You know? Exactly. I mean, when, when you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but also too, like sitting up in bed and hearing Lenny Bro and then, and then, hearing pure Desmond, you know, I mean, if I didn't hear that pure Desmond album that time, I, I might not have heard it for like another year or two. Who knows? I might not have heard it on the radio or, or had anybody tell me about it. Uh, and, and that to me, that was a re for me, that was a real turning point. Right. You know, hearing, hearing the beautiful things that Ed was playing. The, uh, the first song that I probably lifted was that solo on, uh, just, just uh just please me or just tease me or whatever that just song is squeeze me. just squeeze me yeah. yeah that's it there's so many hip things in there that just yeah da, da. i could go on it went, yeah That, that. Oh, sorry. B, uh, B, or, and then. I don't know any jazz guitar player, in, including Jim Hall, who would do that. Right. And that's like what Lenny used to do, right? Would he play yeah. like. You get that wide separation. Well, yeah, because what, yeah. what, it, and this is something I teach my students too. It, you know, it dawned on me, but the, the genius with what Lenny did, because Lenny did it more, like, more regular, more frequently than Ed did, but Le Lenny would take standard shapes down, like, down here, you know, like fourth shapes and then augmented fourth shapes and whatever else, and he would play them up here or here. So he's taking a voicing that's in the lower register and playing a melody note that's in the higher register. And guess what? That's what piano players do. That's why it sounded pianistic. Right. And I, I just thought, fuck, what a revelation. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, and so I, I use that sound, not like all the time, but quite often, because I love that. I like the, I love the sound of that spread. And that, those, those last like 16 or 18 measures of, of Ed solo in that yeah. song, just squeeze me. That's probably why I wanted to learn the solo. Yeah. <laughs> Right and, yeah, and that sounds like a big band horn section. And when he yeah. went like this, he goes like, and then you know, you know. Anyway, yeah. And you know the other thing, the other thing, amazing thing that probably a lot of people don't know, is that a lot of Ed solos contain little melodic fragments from a million tunes. You know this thing here? You know what that is? That's a quote from a, a Lee Morgan tune called Sidewinder. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then on I'm Old Fashioned, uh, Ed quotes when he goes, you know. Uh, you know what that, and this part. Quoting the verse from "But Not for Me," 
Like Ed oh, knew okay. every song ever written, and he would take little melodies from those songs, and he would sort of juxtapose or superimpose them over other tunes where they would work. Yeah. And he wouldn't do it in a way that was premeditated or like a lick. He just because Ed's Ed's playing was very very melodic and very pure. Yeah. And, we, and he would and then he, by extension he would do that with melodies, like I said, and he would harmonize those melodies on the fly. Yeah. Well, that and then you summed that up nicely. That's what I've always thought. It's just everything that Ed played was so pure. Yeah. There was nothing. Yeah. There was no grandstanding. There was nothing wasted. It's like, I mean, as great as Pat Martino is, he plays an awful lot of stuff that he doesn't really have to play. And Larry Coryell, the same. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the pyrotechnical shit. That's you know, after a while, it's like, come on, you know, like take a breath. Come up for air for a minute. <laughs> yeah. And Ed, Ed was like the opposite. He, he was always coming up for air at yeah. the right time. Uh, but, man, he had chops. I mean, like... Oh, no, he had ridiculous chops. On, on that album he did with Sonny Greenwich and uh, Frank Rosalino and a few other things. No, ridiculous. When, when, but, I, when I hear him play, like I just ran across that I haven't heard play in a long time. Um, I was doing some research on, on just different versions of songs mm -hmm. for, for a YouTube video I was doing. Yeah. And I was like, "Have you met Miss Jones?" And he's just burning on that. And oh some man, no, it's great ridiculous. ideas on there. Oh no, it's incredible. No, I mean, he had more than enough chops. Uh, it's just that he he sometimes he would use them, then other times he would he would use them when he when he felt uh, that it was for a, a musical end in it. Right. You know, he wouldn't just play shit. Yeah. Like a lot of those other cats, they play a lot of stuff because there's not maybe, they're, maybe they're not, you know, nobody's inspired 100% of the time. So instead of leaving space, they fill it in with stuff until they, something, until the real thing comes along, sort of. And I've got a, a bit of a Ed story too. You know, the, the Rex parties that they have for the yep. players? Well, I, I got up to play, I think it was just Friends or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then as I'm getting down the, off the stage, I realized Ed was standing there yeah. <laughs> in the back of the room watching me play or whatever. So I went over and talked to him and, and he goes, and I don't remember exactly what I, we were talking about, but I said, yeah, I, you know, I'm just kind of recently getting into playing a little bit more like Lenny bro style. He's like, mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, he goes, I like most of what you played. <laughs> So I thought, well, that's I'll take it. That's good. <laughs> if you if you thought you liked most of what I played, well, you know I'll what? take it. I mean, at, like having played with Ed a bunch of times, and uh, he was a man of few words. Like he only said things when he wanted, when he felt like saying them. Right. That that tour that I was on with him in Spain, we were on our way to a gig one night, and he turned to me in the back seat of a car, and he said, uh, "You're doing some pretty fine picking there." <laughs> and that's all he said. And yeah. I thought that's like that's like uh, being a devout Catholic and, and and having an audience with the Pope, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Or, or you're, being you're a piano pat, player and Bill Evans said, "Hey, man, I really dug what you were doing there." Yeah. I mean, you know, wow. Yeah, well, you know. Anyway, yeah. So I uh, yeah. So it's yeah. I took it. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about your uh, your newest recording a little bit or? Oh uh... uh, sure, I can mention a couple things. So, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's called This Song is New, uh -huh. and uh, it's on the Modica re uh, uh, record label. Uh, producer Ro Roberto Acapinti. It was actually, we did it in very, very, like, just, just before New Year's 2019. It was essentially just a rehearsal. I wrote a couple tunes. I thought, I don't want to just maybe run them down with the guys I'd like to play with, like Kirk and Kieran Overs and Barry Robert. And we... we we were at Roberto's studio and he says, well, I'm just going to tape it. And then, you know, you can have a, a good demo for, uh, to try and get some money and do it for real. Yeah. So, I, cause the, most of the tunes, the originals that I wrote, they were, most of them were like by and large first takes. Most of them were first takes. So there was a few warts here and there, but there was some good energy, you know? And, um, uh, Anyway, so we recorded it, and then a few months went by, and I thought, and then Roberto said, you know, I've been listening to it. You know, I think he got a jazz record here. I said, I don't know, man. I mean, it, we just we just went in and kind of, you know, read the shit down, sort of. And he said, well, I know, but there's there's some energy there, and the, and the tunes sound quite good. And I said, well, and then I waited a couple more months, and I, then I listened to it with fresh ears, 
and then I, um, uh, so anyway, yeah, so I listened to it with, with fresh ears, and um, I thought, you know, there's some, there's some moments here, you know, so I said to Roberto, I said, you know, I haven't done a, I haven't done a recording under my own name in about 25 years, like I said, I'm not, I'm not into product, I'm in the process, so, uh, he said, yeah, well, let's see if we can get some factor uh, money to, like, put it out for, like, you know, manufacturing and, you know, stuff like that. And, and, and so long story short, so we wound up releasing it. Friend, a great friend of mine, uh, this guy Paul Sitch, great graphic, internationally uh, recognized graphic artist. I've known him since York University a million years ago. He did the artwork. We got it, like, remastered, you know, and then mm -hmm. manufactured. Put it out, and it's gotten uh, quite a quite a few like positive reviews. Nothing really negative, actually. But and well, and that you know and that's it. So it was, I just thought you know I haven't done anything in a long time. The pandemic is on. You know I, I don't usually you know I've written a few tunes over the years. Every once in a while I go on a little binge. The tunes sound pretty good. Uh, and I thought well why not? Everybody and their mother is putting out recordings all the time. So I thought. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not I'm not looking at it as an opportunity to make a bunch of money, but I just thought I haven't done anything, so let's just go for it, and that'll be that. And right. That's you know that's it, sort of in a nutshell. Well, and, and uh, congratulations, by the way. Oh well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> because I, mean, uh, uh, I don't I don't feel uh, as bad now that I haven't released anything in seven years. So. <laughs> oh well, like I said, well, I mean, I've been on numerous recordings over the uh -huh. last several years, like as a sideman, but right. as a leader, you know. And it's not something I, uh, like I said, I, it's it's not something that I that I, I find all that attractive or that I, f I feel a need to do, you know, because uh, I've been working on so many things, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, I took Stable Mates and Seven Steps to Heaven and revamped it. You know, Seven Steps is in five and Stable Mates is a boss of in seven. So it's got a different vibe, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's got some of the originals. So it's um, and it's a little bit more out of my lane because most people generally associate me with like just standards. So I put a, a, you know, I tried to put a bit of a slant on the two jazz standards and then have some kind of original tunes that harmonically are a little bit more off the beaten path. Right. And uh, so, yeah. So, again, it's just another it's another stop on the journey. Yeah. That's really all it is, you know. So. Well, you, I think maybe what you got to re realize is that uh, you, you're even though you might not be putting out albums for you. Yeah. Think about it for everyone else. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, I mean, at some point I would like to maybe do a solo. Uh, I mean, that's all I do at home is sit around and play solo guitar. Right. So maybe one day I'll go into a, a, a studio or, or uh, get some recording software and just lay a bunch of stuff down and see if there's anything there I like and maybe do something with it. Yeah, it's not really that hard to record yourself at home oh, no, these days. No, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. I just that I just uh, yeah. I don't know. For me, my, my my default is I pick up my guitar and I start playing. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. um, I'm having so much fun doing that, and I'm learning so much. I mean, that to me is really the most important thing. Yeah, for me, I was kind of, you know, I would go through different phases of, of, of more practice and then not as much practice, but, you know. Sure, yeah. But I had surgery done on my shoulder December 24th, 2019. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, so that I couldn't play for about six weeks. And then right when the doctor gave me a go the go-ahead to start playing again, that's when the pandemic hit. So, or actually it was, what am I saying? Six weeks. I was in, it was in a, like a, a not a cast, but a, a sling for, for seven weeks. Okay. And then after three months, he said, you can, you can start playing again. Oh, so, so it was, wow, that's a really so, long so time. So that's when the, the pandemic hit. And then, I don't know, I just kind of, because I, I was always practicing and thinking, getting ready for gigs, you know. Right. When there's no gigs, I guess maybe that part of that motivation was not there so but so i put a lot of my creative energy into making videos for my youtube channel and stuff yeah well so you're that's okay so you're being creative in other ways so that's good yeah. i mean for me if there's no gigs it just means i practice more yeah. <laughs> and like i don't practice i mean if i had a recording of playing someone else's music and it was oh well, even if it wasn't all that challenging but i'd be spending a lot of time doing that but 
Yeah, I mean, someone asked me, they said, like, uh, how come you don't do a, a lot of recording? I said, well, it cuts into my practicing time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember uh, that one music camp that, that I taught at one year that you were there. Uh, you're, what, you were sitting on the porch practicing, and you're, and all of a sudden you realized, you said to me, uh, what am I doing practicing? I'm, I should be relaxing or something like that. <laughs> oh, man, what camp was it? Was it the IMC camp? The jazz yeah, camp? yeah, yeah. Like okay. camp, camp jazz and camp rock or whatever. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. the jazz camp. Yeah, that, the Lake Manitowoc up near Perry Sound. Yeah, it was a good hang. The one year that I did it. I only did it the one year. Yeah. Well, I was up there for almost 20 years. Mm. Doing it, but yeah, it was, it was fun, I guess. A lot of hanging, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just remember a, pot a lot of potato cannons going on. <laughs> well, yeah, that's Campbell Riga. Yeah. Everyone, I think you should check out his latest recording. This song is new. Yeah, it's and on I, Mo the Modica Music label. It's on Spotify and Bandcamp, and and I've actually I've got uh, and it's available on CD, hard copy, and uh, I think you can get it through Bandcamp. Or if anybody wants to contact me directly, send me send me. Uh, you've got my email. They can I can just send them a CD if they want. Whatever. Sure. Either I, or. I, you know, you can check out his website, lornlofsky.com, L-O-R-N-E-L-O-F-S-K-Y.com. Thanks, man. And and then he ha also has, by the way, you know, you, you have a great online jazz guitar education website. That's lornlofskyjazz.com, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there's four or five, five or six lessons there. Uh, you know, pretty fairly basic, but there's some good material there. You know, yeah. enough to sink your teeth into well, Lauren, thanks so much for doing this. Oh, hey, man, thank you. It's great to see you, and uh, all the best. You know, I'm I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for everybody that uh, we're all back to work in some way, shape, or form after this pandemic. <laughs>